Diaz gets the mount. My goodness. Now he's got, he's got the bat. Him now. That's it. He's got the shot. Nate Diaz. He's got it. I want to know something that's going to absolutely blow your mind. Try me. Okay. This is the second episode of The Wayne. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and you know what that means? What? This can be our best episode or this can be our worst episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I thought of this today and I thought this was going to kill. I thought this was just going to go viral. People are going to watch this and going to go like, oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> His <laughs> understanding of mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> mathematics? Two, two possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I drew a Venn diagram. I don't think that's what Venn, diag- <laughs> Venn diagrams are for. We should stick to MMA. <laughs> uh, yeah, even that's a little under question as, <laughs> as, as of right now. Because like I said, this is the second episode of The Way. And thank you so much for tuning in. Danel Nasim Mirza, joined by Badr Ali, as always. Um, we have a lot to talk about. Wow. What? Okay, first of all, I just want to say, uh, for everybody who wonders how MMA fans exist in the world, in of, well, not the world, but exist in Pakistan when it comes to watching fights live, and it's blah, blah, blah. like how do you wake up at five in the morning and go watch a fight i was a little skeptic i'm not gonna lie of waking up for this card because i was like you know normally let's be honest we wouldn't wake up for ufc vancouver uh we would probably watch it immediately the next day yeah but like, i am so glad we woke up for this card wow 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 that was amazing that was, like from start to finish that card <laughs> delivered in terms of uh quality of fights in terms of finishes um in terms of eye pokes even because <laughs> that was what happened to todd duffy very unfortunate yeah, i don't understand but there's like this weird perception around ufc fight night it's that it's just it's it's not a main card mm-hmm. it's not gonna deliver the same as say a highlight period. i don't think that's true no not true because if you take away the titles if you take away all the contendership if if you just look at fight quality, this was better than a lot of cards I've seen yeah. this year, man. This is pretty good. That was this is such a good card. Um, of course, there's so much to talk about yeah. from this card. Where else to start? <laughs> but uh, Donald Cerrone, Justin Gaethje, wow. wow. I mean, Justin Gaethje has been uh, a threat ever since he's moved over from the UFC, uh, moved over to the UFC. Pardon me, um, and he's taken on the likes of Michael Johnson. Uh, he was very impressive against James Wick. Um, he was. He's just been. He's just been very. This very, is what his his third first round knockout. Yeah, in a row. Wow, that's insane if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Um, that too coming off of two losses that I personally thought would break him. Yeah. I thought it was going to be another Darren Till situation, possibly. Yeah, except Justin Gaethje, if you remember, came into the UFC unbeaten. Yeah, um, exactly. Absolutely undefeated, really feared. Then he put out James Wick, of course, and then Edson Barboza, which is, again, two very impressive back-to-back finishes. And then now to be able to do this to somebody like, not Donald Cerrone, not Cowboy Cerrone. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Dad Cerrone. This is the father of danger Cerrone, literally. Um and wow, that was that was really impressive. Uh, primarily because I the fight played out pretty much how I expected it would. Uh, mm-hmm. Donald Cerrone was much more technical. He tried to keep a certain distance. He wasn't able to throw any kicks, um, which was interesting because that's one of his best uh, things. Justin Gaethje, of course, using the outside leg kicks like he does. Dude, he was so, so patient. I, I saw like a whole new level of patience from Justin Gaethje. Yeah, because he's just been famous as this one dude that just knows that his ground game and that his wrestling game is strong enough to support him wherever the fight goes so he just stands and trades with you yeah but this time he was so patient with the build-up he was so patient with leading him in with those leg kicks yeah it was it was a phenomenal fight from Gaethje yeah exactly and you know it was it was just a matter of whether Gaethje's going to be able to get um into that distance which is a really close distance that he really likes fighting in and he was able to use those hooks exactly how he want to and he just put out somebody like Donald Cerrone, who's a very hard guy to put away Dude. if history ever tells us anything about Donald Cerrone. And that was a very, very impressive win uh, for Justin Gaethje. Uh, but of course, now uh, we look towards the future. And Donald Cerrone, of course, this is very interesting, very motivating to see as well. Uh, who people are saying are is, are the prime, or sorry, at the twilight of his career. And maybe even as prime, if you don't count the last two fights. But somebody that people are saying is now at the twilight of his career, after losing to Justin, after getting knocked out to mm-hmm. Justin Gaethje, um, says that he is undoubtedly somehow going to win the lightweight championship or at least some kind of a strap. Uh, do I realistically see that happening? 
not really mm. same i i don't see that happening but just to see him put that out um and if anything has shown anything about donald ceroni's proven to be true that you don't count this guy out yeah man. under any circumstances donald ceroni can come back um this is a career comeback that we're seeing from him right now after beating the likes of alexander hernandez mike perry um and ally quinta who are all younger um maybe not as hungrier uh because he put them away uh, all in impressive fashion where well, he didn't put away Ali Quinta but you know I'm not counting out Donald Cerrone for the promises he makes me uh, but ultimately it's really exciting to see where he goes from here especially considering that the BMF title is now a thing <laughs> the baddest mother ever on the planet <laughs> title is an actual thing and if anybody fits the bill fits the description um you know it's Donald Cerrone He is a bad, bad mother effer. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, my mom watches this podcast, <laughs> and my dad watches this podcast too. And last time they're like, "Hey, you, you swore a few times and stuff like that." And I said, "I'm sorry. I'm 23. I thought I could do that kind of stuff, but apparently I can't." Viewers, so I yeah, but I no, bumped. seriously, man. Like <laughs> even after um, Donald Cerrone put up that fight, so my first instinct was that hey, maybe he's going to retire. But then I'm thinking this guy's never missed weight. No. He's always shown up to fight when he said he's going to fight. He's not going anywhere, I don't no. think. Do you think he's moving up? I don't think he's going to move up. No, either. he's already gone up to 170 and tried that experiment. It's not going to work. It didn't really work out well for him. Uh and I think 155 is just so much of a better fit uh fit for Donald Cerrone especially in terms of, you know, how he's built and how he fights and the kind of opponents at 170 as uh, 155 as, as opposed to 170. At 170 you saw bigger, stronger guys. Um Donald Cerrone is a really technical fighter. He has explosive knockout power of course he does uh but ultimately to be in there with somebody at 155 pounds i just think makes so much more sense for him but then like think about it who does he have to face mm. right now see this is uh, this is a point where i wish he would if nothing else uh i don't know i can't give you exact name right now but what i can say is i hope he fights a wrestler uh prime not because i think that's a good fit for him we saw what happened in the leon edwards fight uh but wrestler primarily because after fighting kechi um and then you know his last loss to tony ferguson uh and if he really does want to break all the records and make them un uh, matchable as he said he said he wants to set so many records and none of these young guys can ever catch up to it if that's what he's out to do if that's what he's out to prove then i think it only makes sense for him to fight somebody who isn't going to hit him on the head so many times and i think after fighting as much as donald cerrone has fought in his career if he gets to select opponents as opposed to fighting whoever the hell they put in front of him i think he's one guy who's earned that privilege so whoever he fights i just hope um He's not a heavy hitter so to speak. But if you look at the rankings of course, um you have some interesting names in there. You have uh Paul Felder at number 7. You have Yeah, but Paul Felder is coming off a win. I don't think he's going to take the Cerrone fight. Oh, I think anybody would love to take the Cerrone fight. He is Cerrone is at the peak of his popularity, man. Even in Vancouver they were going crazy for yeah, him. Yeah, but at the same time even though he's a popular fighter, it's the same McGregor argument that a win over him is really going to get you anywhere in the rankings. Yeah, I suppose. But see, here's the thing. Uh Gregor Gillespie is somebody who makes a lot of sense for me. Uh primarily because I Gregor agree. Gillespie called out um Anthony Pettis who's a welterweight now. He, I don't think he realized. But Gregor Gillespie is ranked number 12, sorry, number 11 uh at lightweight. He's a wrestler. I'm not saying it's an easy fight, but I think that's a good matchup for Cowboy primarily because of his his modus operandi, <clears throat> so to speak. I don't think I use wow. that properly. <laughs> <laughs> I speak three languages. <laughs> <laughs> two words in latin or do in english anyway um but yeah gregor gillespie makes a lot of sense primarily because uh he's a wrestler uh he's durable he's young so if he wants to really test himself against the young guys i think this makes a lot of sense but i think um uh, donald cerrone will do what donald cerrone pleases and i think we should just uh let cerrone do whatever the hell he wants at this point but one guy uh who we should probably talk about is the guy who knocked him out just engaging man phenomenal that's his third first round knockout yeah and he has been on such good form so for me like the way that this shapes up for gechi is pretty simple it's that either he gets a title shot or his fight if he wins it he gets a title shot after that so right now ahead of him you have khabib obviously the champion you have dustin poirier and then you have tony ferguson and conor, conor mcgregor, McGregor. <laughs> so i think with the conor mcgregor fight 
So a lot of people are saying that Justin Gaethje just shut up the prospect of a Conor McGregor fight, but I don't think so. He said that he wants to shut up the Irishman once and for all, and I think that he could take that fight. Look, I, I have a theory. I'm going to theorize right now, right? With um, your modus operandi, my <laughs> modus operandi, and my act is <laughs> It's another Latin word, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That just means intent. No, act, act of the crime, or something to that. I didn't study law. <laughs> I just used to debate a lot, and I used to hear this anyway. Um, <laughs> this guy, uh, Justin Gaethje, has further added to a theory of mine, which is the era of the trash talker. And we can talk about Michelle Ferreira, and we will talk about Michelle Ferreira right after this. But the era of the trash talker, show border, show stealer, big charisma guy is over. Nobody likes that guy anymore. Nobody likes Conor McGregor anymore. Nobody wants to fight Conor McGregor, not because he's not a draw, but because people despise him so much that they might not even want to do anything with him. Here's the evidence for this theory. Nate Diaz, <laughs> right after <laughs> right after beating Anthony Perez, instead of calling the obvious fight of the McGregor trilogy, goes ahead and calls out the baddest motherfucker on the planet, Jorge Masvidal. Sorry, mom. Um, <laughs> I swore. Um, <laughs> and then just now, Justin Gaethje further adds fuel to that theory. He was asked whether he wants an Irishman or a Russian, and he said the Irishman's retired, so just give me the Russian. And I think fighters are now out to prove a certain point that you don't need the trash talking big money draw guy in order for their fights to matter and i think that's exactly what nate did by inserting himself and hori masvidal in the main event of madison square garden november 8th ufc 244 yeah i just feel like you know like so it's kind of like how society functions in a weird way so like you have the fighters at the top and then those fighters are the fighters that are trash talking those are the fighters that are trying to build why are you laughing at me i'm not <laughs> i thought this is some sociological analysis of the ufc coming here some stratification bullshit no, but like, so think, about <laughs> yeah, it, think about it with me so you have a lot of these fighters that are trash talkers that are just straight up people that are gonna you know verbally fight their way to a title shot they're gonna verbally fight their way up the rankings and then they're gonna prove themselves when they finally get a matchup with these fighters i think it's been so long that they've just kind of been stealing fights from the guys that are putting in the hard work think yeah. about it so conor mcgregor just swoops into the lightweight division one day and becomes a double champion yeah so and, and you can arguably that, say he said the same thing in featherweight sorry oh. yeah exactly but like so the thing is that these fighters are getting these opportunities not necessarily because they're great fighters taking nothing away they they are great fighters but the focus has been purely on the way that these fighters just promote themselves it hasn't been about their fighting capability in particular and i think that's pissed people off yeah i think that's pissed people like justin gaethje off that's definitely pissed off nate diaz and exactly why i think your theory is correct yeah because nate diaz is kind of leading the charge yeah, the era i think of the they've just gotten pretty antagonized with all this sorry for cutting no, you off no. but it's just that they're getting it, it, it is changing because i think they're just sick of it they just don't get the fights and now the majority fighters want to get matched up according to skill set a podcast really changes a person normally we talk over each other and <laughs> shout and yell and we say shut the fuck and here we are going sorry to cut you off brother sorry to cut you off that it's totally fine my friend um but yeah that's exactly that is that is true and uh, colby covington for example uh has built his entire <laughs> person i'm not taking anything away from colby i think colby is a very underrated fighter primarily <laughs> because people get so lost in his Such trash talk henry cejudo henry cejudo <laughs> <laughs> is another example <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and and look Conor McGregor again I also think Conor McGregor Colby Covington Covington two of the most underrated fighters in the UFC primarily because their trash talk and their antics and Henry Cejudo even has taken away from the fact that these guys are really really yeah. good and ultimately that would matter if people want to go and buy into their fights if people want to call them out just so they can you know get that fight and get that big payday but people and more specifically fighters are now realizing that they don't need to put themselves through the abuse of sitting opposite to Conor McGregor at a press conference to sell a pay-per-view you can be Nate Diaz calling out another gangster and being a West Coast gangster and doing Nate Diaz things and fighting Jorge Masvidal and now going to sell out Madison Square Garden as the main event i can't stress on this enough by the way this has been announced they are the main event um and this is important primarily because cowboy versus connor was discussed for an earlier date and they did not put that fight through because they wanted connor sorry they wanted the main event to be a title match 
<clears throat> Listen, nothing's going Conor McGregor's way anymore. Conor McGregor wanted the Jorge Masvidal fight, according to reports. And Dana said he won't get it because Conor's too small and Jorge is too big. Now the guy that Conor fought and beat once is getting the Jorge Masvidal fight instead. Nothing seems to be going Conor McGregor's way anymore. I don't understand it. Nobody's wanting to fight him. Khabib's manager, Ali Abdulaziz, says that Khabib, 0.00% chance... I don't think that's a percentage. Zero point zero zero percent. That's a lot of zeros. If you think I am supposed to be taking the GRE in a few months, I just, I just had zero. Anyway, um, zero percent chance. This is zero point zero zero percent chance that he takes a counter fight. So the era of the trash talker, my friend, is over, and you heard first here on the mic. <laughs> and I'm willing to bet on this that the UFC is more willing to make the Gaethje Ferguson fight over McGregor facing either of them at this point. Yeah. From a promotional aspect, I think that's what they're going for now. Well, actually, the Gaethje situation is a little interesting. Primarily because you want Gaethje um, to be at the top of the, you know, card or closer to the title picture as a promoter. Because Gaethje will always promise you. And it's his philosophy. And he's not just talking out of his ass. He means it oh, when he says definitely. that if he, he, when he goes in there, it's either he gets knocked out or he knocks someone out. But if you look at the post fight, uh, post fight, post fight, post fight, uh, and or the, just the perspective, right? Um, Justin Gaethje said he's willing to wait um, for the Khabib Tony match to happen, which is first of all very respectful of him because that implies that Tony Ferguson is the rightful number one contender. He is. Because he is. There's no doubt there. Yeah. Tony Ferguson is next in line. What? He's on a 12 fight winning streak. Yeah, 12 fight. In 12 the fight winning oh, streak. Yeah. White. <laughs> 12 fight winning streak. <laughs> um, and yeah, honestly, like if you think about it, uh, that makes sense. And I guess Justin Gaethje to acknowledge that is very nice of him and very, very uh, mature of him or professional of him, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But there are two questions here that I will pose to you. The first one being, does it make sense for Justin Gaethje to wait that long? And the second being, if he waits that long, is there even a guarantee that he gets the winner of Tony Khabib? You see, here I think that the more he waits, because he's proven himself to be an asset, <clears throat> sorry, it'll be even more likely that he'll get a title shot. Because I think it's only fair. The UFC needs to make it happen. Khabib needs to say yes. Justin Gaethje needs to wait. Tony Ferguson deserves the title match, man. Yeah. Like, I don't see it any other way. I, I don't see G Justin Gaethje on the same level as Tony Ferguson yet. He's coming off of two losses previously as well. Yeah. Like, in his last five fights, he's won three. He's lost two. Yeah. But even within that, like, Tony Ferguson deserves that title match. And I don't think the UFC is just going to drop Justin Gaethje out. So here's my concern. If you're Justin Gaethje and you're willing to wait until Tony and Khabib are done fighting... There's a few invariables that come into it. First of all, when is Khabib going to fight again? We don't know that. He just got off uh, beating Dustin Poirier in Abu Dhabi. Um, and he deserves a well-deserved rest. And he didn't call out Tony Ferguson. He didn't take any names. Um, that's a separate debate in and of itself, whether he should or should not have done that. Um, but ultimately, he didn't do that. So that means that there's a chance that that <clears throat> fight may happen in three months, six months, nine months. And until then, do you as Justin Gaethje just sit and wait? And the second thing I have a problem with is that there's all the reason for the UFC to give Conor McGregor anybody who they think he can beat. And if he beats that one guy, or even worst case scenario, if he beats nobody at all, they still have all the reason in the world to just say the winner of Tony Khabib gets Conor McGregor. And you know what? At that point, they might not even turn it down. So I just think sitting around waiting isn't good for Justin Gaethje. I think he has nothing left to prove. He has three first round knockouts against people who are top contenders in the UFC lightweight division. But ultimately, as a fighter, you really have to think that you have to keep yourself relevant. There was speculation that they were <clears throat> offering Connor and Gaethje uh, a fight between each other. And both sides agreed. But then Connor bust his hand or something. Um, and that didn't go through. Now there seems to be, I don't know if Gaethje's playing hardball or if he actually just doesn't want to fight. But this seems to be the direction that he doesn't want to go. Okay, so let's break it down for Justin Gaethje. So right now, right ahead of him is Conor McGregor. Mm -hmm. We kind of talked about that. That's a matchup that could... No, thank you. That's a matchup that could happen. But if you look beyond that, then there's Tony Ferguson. I see a lot of merit in Gaethje possibly fighting Ferguson. And that too, only if something happens between Khabib and Ferguson and that fight doesn't work out, then I see that fight happening. But otherwise... 
I don't think there's any point for Ferguson to take the Gaethje fight. But then beyond that, Dustin Poirier, it makes no sense for Gaethje. Why is he going to try to beat someone who already lost to the champion? Um, uh, well, actually, it could make sense because uh, one of the two losses that Gaethje had before his 3-5 win streak were against Eddie Alvarez, who is now getting concussions in 1FC. Uh, and then <laughs> it's Dustin Poirier uh, who beat uh, Justin Gaethje pretty convincingly. Um, that was, I believe, a fourth-round knockout. It was a very good fight as well. Yeah. Um, so that fight could make sense, but ultimately, yeah. uh, the only p- guy right now who is saying Conor McGregor's name is the Diamond, Dustin Poirier. And that fight, honestly, is good for me because they fought centuries ago. Yeah. Literally centuries ago. And Poirier. by then, Poirier's come leaps and bounds. Poirier was really green back then. Yeah. yeah, I would even say McGregor was really green back then, my friend. Like, I think both of them have come leaps and bounds. And I'm not saying the rematch makes sense because Connor um, can't beat him this time. I will pick Connor in that fight. If you ask me right now, if you put me on the spot, put a gun to my head, I will say Connor McGregor beats uh, D- Dustin Poirier the second time around as well. All I'm saying is that that fight makes sense because they've come such a long way. They're such better fighters. It's so much more exciting. I'm buying into that. Um, but ultimately, Another question that I'll pose to you, my friend, is does Justin Gaethje possess the skill set to answer the unsolvable question of how do you beat Khabib Nurmagomedov? That's a tough one, but again, I don't think so. Really? Yeah. Because, like, if you're going to look for someone that's explosive, someone that has knockout power. <clears throat> okay, so I pose a question to you. Who do you think is better on the feet? Poirier or Justin Gaethje? I would say Justin Gaethje. I mean, primarily, not not like objectively. I don't think there's any way to yeah, measure two fighters in terms of how good they are. Yeah, right? You can barely predict a fight. <laughs> you can't predict a fight, like at all. Um, but okay. Um, <clears throat> unless you're Shriyar Qureshi, by the way. Shout out Shriyar Qureshi. He's going to be on the show soon. Um, and he's actually very notorious for getting fights exactly right. Wow. I don't know. I don't, like, I follow wow. his Instagram. And uh, he'll say round three knockout or round three submission. And that's sometimes exactly what happens. I know it could be dumb luck, but it happens a lot to him. And he brags about it a lot. Some people, they can just predict these things. Yeah, predict <laughs> these things, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. But yeah, no, um, you can't predict a fight in MMA. But here's the thing. Uh, in terms of who matches up better against Khabib, I think what you need uh, isn't raw technical prowess or a boxing skill set which is going to again be able for, for you to be able to jab jab and then eventually get a big shot uh you need to be somebody like justin gaethje uh, who's lost who's lost half of his brain fighting uh and he just wants to come out there swing for the fences and of course the other half and somehow become <laughs> champion <laughs> and somehow become cha- i'm fine with that if justin gaethje loses his entire brain and becomes champion <laughs> thank god because khabib normal made of reign is over but because <laughs> I really, really want that guy to lose now. But what I'm saying is, Justin Gaethje, um, if he's able to close the distance, if he's able to land those shots, I think he has more power. I think he has more explosiveness than Conor McGregor, more explosiveness than Dustin Poirier. And he has something of a hidden talent that we haven't seen yet from him because he chooses not to opt into, uh, chooses not to opt is the same thing, Daniel, chooses not to show something, which is his wrestling skill set, which has been there from him since day one. But he just chooses for some reason not to indulge in the wrestling aspect of the game. Yeah, I think it's very smart because Justin Gage's game plan is simple, that he will strike with you. He will be loose and he will be on the verge of getting hit and he will be counterstruck. But... He's not scared because even if he falls down, even if you try to get on top of him, he has that wrestling base. He can still figure something out. And I think it's off of that comfort that he bases his entire offense on. Yeah, I don't think he would have been this com- comfortable getting into the pocket with people like Donald Cerrone yeah. if he didn't know that he could handle himself if it hits the mat. Yeah, and he was doing wrestling pummels and uh, wrestling drills right before the fight. So I was speculating that if the fight goes a certain length, he might just show us a takedown for once, but didn't get to that. Um, and you know what? The reason I say Justin Gaethje has a better chance of beating Khabib um, than Dustin Poirier um, is twofold. Number one, because it's uh, 
it's it's confirmation bias because we've seen Dustin Poirier lose to Khabib Nurmagomedov, so obviously anybody who hasn't fought Khabib has a better chance. But also, if it's based on some kind of logic, if I have to really think about it, um, it's because we've seen Khabib get hit, but we haven't seen him get hit by somebody who packs such a punch that you can put your lights out at any minute. Uh, we've seen him get hit against Michael Johnson. I uh, Quinta. Yeah, I Quinta to <clears> a certain extent. Poirier in this match. Yeah, and Poirier in this match to a certain extent, and even Tony Ferguson's gotten hit and dropped. But then again, there's a difference. Yeah. Between the reason I say there's he has a chance is because there's a dis- difference between getting hit by Justin Gaethje and there's a difference between getting hit by Michael Johnson and Lando Venata or and I, Conor McGregor or Conor, okay okay I see what yeah. you did there I see what you did there yeah but don't so, listen to Conor <laughs> <laughs> yeah go on yeah but hear me out for now so um, <laughs> Conor Mc- I think <laughs> that's the saddest thing I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, that's my Funko Pop of Conor McGregor. I swear I don't talk to it. I hope it's in one of the angles. It is so weird. Let me, let me just show you. This is my Funko Pop of Conor McGregor. I just told it to uh, block its ears. <laughs> told, it. told it. <laughs> told him. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but like, told him not to listen to what Mother is saying. And I swear I don't talk to inanimate objects. Otherwise, is a phone? Does a phone count as an inanimate object that you talk to? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> episode three. <laughs> Are we, is this the best episode, the worst, or is this the last? <laughs> Find out next. <laughs> this is the last one. I believe this is the last one. But, oh my god! Like no. So back to Conor McGregor. So the thing is that even if he does have, like, even if Khabib has a heavy hitter up against him, <coughs> he has ways to neutralize them, and that's what he did against Conor McGregor yeah. in the third round. Even though Conor may have taken that third round. It was the rest of the fight where Khabib just didn't let him catch him, man. Yeah. Like, he's just... He has pretty good head movement. He's not a bad boxer at all. And at all points, I think it's just this fear associated with fighting Khabib and, you know, standing across from him that you just do not open up with your strikes because you're afraid that if you overcommit to the striking game, he's just going to level change and take you down and it's going to be within a heartbeat. Yeah. So I think that even though you can bring a fighter with more punching power, heck, even if you put like Francis Ngannou in front of him at some point, like he does have the ability to just take someone down and keep them there. I so don't he kind know of about Francis Ngannou, man. Okay, He's sure, big. not Francis Khabib's Ngannou. as big as Francis Ngannou's leg, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Any of these lightweights are as big as... But you get the point that I'm yeah, trying no, to make, that it's not saying. about punching power. Yeah. And even if, yeah, there was the same thing that happened with the McGregor fight, that McGregor wasn't going to, you know, just keep Khabib at bay for five rounds and win a decisive decision over him. No, no yeah. he was, he was going to knock him out at some point. Yeah, you have other. to put him out of there unless, yeah. And is it just that? Is it a... Puncture, puncher, puncher's chance. Puncher's <laughs> chance? No, it's, it's, see, it's not a puncher's chance per se. Um, I think it's still some kind of, um, you know, and it's funny, it's actually pretty interesting that you say puncher's chance because normally that's associated to somebody who's so good at striking that the only way you can beat him is by a lucky punch. But in Khabib's case, he's so good at wrestling, <laughs> yeah. literally the only way you can beat him is by a lucky punch. Um, of course, Tony Ferguson might disagree with us. Uh, you might disagree with <laughs> everything we've said so far. Um, if you're watching, don't no, he's not watching. <laughs> Tony Ferguson is not watching our podcast. But um, you know, Tony Ferguson might possess the skills required to match Khabib on the ground, perhaps. Um, but ultimately, what I think is true is that when it comes to Tony Ferguson or Khabib, um, Justin Gaethje has the potential to beat them. Uh, but then again, this is a sport of MMA. Anybody can be anybody at any time, and that's why we absolutely love it. But you know what? Another reason why I love MMA so, so, so much. And for those of you watching who don't watch MMA, first of all, thanks for watching. Um, and also start watching MMA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was about to say. It's start watching MMA. And why are you watching? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Please don't tune out. Um, but what we're saying is the reason you should watch MMA is primarily because of these stories that are told by fighters sometimes. These, these narratives that are built over the course of a fight, not the course of years of story writing and screenplay and all of those things you see in movies and shows. No, no, no. Just one fight can tell you so much about so many things. Like like the human will to just keep fighting, about just the human ability to concentrate on something and just come out on top. These David versus Goliath stories, or in this case, David versus Adonis stories and i'm talking specifically about michelle ferrer and tristan connelly two guys that i never heard of 
but two guys who I'm never going to forget after this fight for completely different reasons. What a fight, first of all. What a fight. What an incredible fight. But there's so much to talk about from this fight from so many different perspect- perspectives. First off, I'm just going to say, Michelle Ferreira can be a superstar if he just applies the gifts and the talents that he's developed for himself because i don't believe in natural born ability but the he can be a superstar if he just uses them in the right proportion at the right time with the right context if you're at a weigh in and you do a backflip like this guy did this guy was on the weighing scale ladies and gentlemen and he did a backflip just cause right and that's fantastic you know what that's the right place and the right time to do this kind of thing but if you're getting introduced by bruce buffer right who is my icon uh and you're just about to fight anybody in the world even you even you if somebody's about to fight you they should take you seriously especially if they're going to fi- fight somebody like Tristan Connolly who's fighting in front of his people from of Canada you should take him seriously and not break dance in the middle of the freaking cage like he was oh, doing oh yeah that that was a bit weird that was a little extra but what i'm trying to say is michel ferrer mm-hmm. has impressed me so much and the, that walkout dance by the way that needs to go <laughs> that was kind of cringy very bollywood cuz like his his coaches were in on it which makes me think like yeah they're <laughs> just doing some kind of weird shuffle and the okay, reason you got to stay 15 minutes after training <laughs> 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 coach can we no <laughs> dance practice <laughs> please coach no it's your brother's fight <laughs> <laughs> but like there's a time and place for these things and right before your fight is not one of those times okay so it would have been okay if you did the break dance after the match so <laughs> yes <laughs> won. If Duh. Just really is that like does it really make a difference if he wants to create that scene for himself before he walks out like Conor McGregor does his walk in is that really you know like making his opponent feel not as <laughs> secure in their abilities listen if you're rolling in the center of the cage on your shoulders and the back of your neck and expending energy just spinning in a circle like a torpedo um that expends energy he was taking at least i saw him take deep breaths right before the fight start and that is unnecessary is all i am saying uh, okay yeah from that perspective it makes sense from like the perspective of like disrespecting your opponent or someone i just oh, no, think no, of no, Nate no, Diaz no. flipping off his opponents before the fight oh no no <laughs> by all means please sir disrespect your opponent that's fine yeah but but don't take him lightly there's a difference right dude he completely like you could tell that he expended some energy there like even though he kind of portrays himself as you said as adonis and as he's you know kind of unstoppable and he has this cardio where he can like run for 3 days or something but you know he, that's you the thing he you can, don't take those risks even if he didn't lose because of all of the break dancing you just don't take those risks yeah now look like uh, look at how much of a fool this guy looks like yeah now. primarily because you can do this when you're at the peak of your career but if you just <laughs> and you know it makes it makes sense if you're starting out and you want to be noticed and nobody's going to remember michel ferreira again but for all the wrong reasons right but if you look at the fight itself even in the fight You saw him do things that I have never seen a fighter do. He he did a front flip off the cage and then he tried to land a flying knee and then he tried to do the closest thing to RV. Ow. I Okay, I was about to dislocate my shoulder <laughs> on the podcast. Sorry guys, this shoulder is needs some work i dislocated two weeks ago but he was doing the closest thing to the rob van dam rolling thunder oh, which yeah. is him flipping over and then trying oh, yeah, to hit he just, he just tried to shoot for a jab and then he flipped over and <laughs> connelly the and reason we have to do this ladies and gentlemen is because this guy was unbelievable in the cage in terms of the things that he was doing which is good but also these bursts of energy that he was doing and that you know when Tristan Connolly was on his back he decides to turn the other way and then do a back flip on top of Tristan that doesn't land but again is extra but again is something that you can do fine but in the bursts uh these bursts of energy need to be there in instances and moments during the fight that makes sense yeah like so i think of mark hunt who did he fall on do you remember that <laughs> <laughs> that bonsai drop yeah, yeah i don't remember one. who it was but yeah 
exactly like, that that's a better use of it i don't understand why you have to like just portray yourself as someone that has the physical capability to just flip off of walls and yeah. land stuff that he can't really land yeah it's like you're just making a fool of yourself at this yeah. point he needed to prove himself in the octagon and i don't think he did yeah but tristan connelly he proved himself see this is this fight was the perfect example uh, of an imbalance between showmanship and showing the fuck up because if you just look at the showmanship aspect one guy really made the fight really good for us to watch but when it comes to showing up Christian Conley should be the guy and is the guy who's getting the largest amount of attention that he's getting during his career he got the bonus as well performance bonus this guy has now the most profitable ufc debut of all time maybe not counting cm punk <laughs> of course who made million a million dollars off of his first loss to mickey gall um i salute you mr punk and i love you so much but um <laughs> Yeah this this guy uh Tristan Connolly he wasn't signed to the UFC this was his debut he was brought in on 5 days notice or was it 4 i don't remember um and he's a lightweight who made weight as opposed to Michelle Ferrer who wasn't making weight who didn't make weight um and Tristan Connolly got both bonuses this guy made $100,000 for fight of the night on his debut in front of his people by beating a guy who was doing backflips and break dancing during and before the fight Tristan Connolly ladies and gentlemen remember the name don't you ever forget it um even if he doesn't do anything for the rest of his career he has given us such a beautiful narrative but i'd really want him to do something for the rest of his career because this guy like he was just so cutthroat in the octagon did you notice how he was just not giving any breathing room yeah like he was just right on top of him all the time this was a no nonsense performance from exactly. him exactly there's from no one side yeah <laughs> he <laughs> tripled the amount of output that was thrown uh, in comparison to michel ferrero that's wow. 151 strikes to 100 to 56 total wow. strikes but where do you think he goes from here because i think he has like two options obviously like one is that he could move back to his original weight at welterweight and try out the division there lightweight Like, no he could move up to welterweight oh, he fought at lightweight okay. right yeah now. yeah no he he fought at welterweight he's originally a lightweight oh yeah sorry i got yeah so the up. narrative is michel ferrer got whooped by a guy who's a lightweight no <laughs> on short notice but yeah go on yeah so i think he does stick to lightweight i think that makes sense um who do you have for him i i don't think he needs uh I don't think he needs to be overexposed or pushed to the moon just yet. I mean, I I'm a fan of Tristan Connolly now. Joe Duffy look. Uh, Joe Duffy looks like a good fight. I think he lost his last two. I think so, yeah. I mean, yeah. Joe Duffy makes a lot of sense actually yeah. now that I think about it. But ultimately, it can be anybody. Uh just stick him in the next Canada card. Uh you don't need to put him in the main event or anything just yet, but like build him up slowly and gradually. This mm-hmm. guy um is money primarily because excuse me. That was really loud. Did you hear that? I Or was it like Mike didn't some catch it. burps I are like <laughs> <laughs> some burps you think are internal, but then they're <laughs> so external that wait, let me check the wave. Yeah, no, the mic definitely <laughs> caught my burp. Um, thank you for watching. <laughs> the last episode <laughs> of the way in. Um, no, but uh, <laughs> I think we're gonna say this every time now. Uh, but yeah, this guy, um, anyone at lightweight makes sense for him. Uh, he of course he's going to stick around with the UFC but what a better way to make your debut um than simply just showing up and shutting up and just making so many headlines and I'm really happy for Christian Conley um and what a fight just overall mm-hmm. this was the fight of the night for good reason I'm so glad I woke up for this card just for this fight alone uh because in the early moments of the fight if you look at my Michelle Ferreira's highlights He did all the things that he did otherwise which is throw those crazy strikes and it's really hard for you know people to understand the patterns on which he's striking <clears throat> but I will say we love Tristan Connolly we've talked about how Michelle Ferreira is an idiot uh but I will say even now the don't count out Michelle Ferreira I think this is an important lesson for every fighter to learn at one point in their career which is that you know you get humbled and i think if he's learned that lesson then this guy from at least what we saw during the fight really does possess a skill set which can be really really dangerous for people moving forward uh yeah but speaking of you know like um, just continuously and gradually building someone up 
What about Jimmy Crute? Oh, Jimmy Crute, man. Where does uh, he go, man? Jimmy Crute, I feel like, uh, <clears throat> see, he was one of the prospects that was coming up. Yeah. And um, I think, see, so he knocked Glover down. I don't know if it was exactly a knockdown. I knocked think Glover. Um, Sorry. Um, Misha Serkinov. Misha Serkinov down. Um, and I think Jimmy Crute right now is, again, a testament to the fact that no matter how good you are, at one point or the other, uh, you need to be slowed down. You can't be pushed to the moon just yet. Dana White needs to be slowed down, man. Dana White definitely needs to be slowed down. Because if you if you just try to think about it, like Dana White just has these prospects and then he decides to push them to the moon. And then while he pushes them to the moon, at some point they just get destroyed. Like think about Nganu. And yeah. think about Crute now. Like, <laughs> yeah. what's he doing? He, I think Dana White just gets really excited <laughs> because he's just getting really sad that he's not getting another McGregor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, uh, for every Jimmy Crute and every... Although I don't think Jimmy Crute's just done yet. But for every Darren yeah. Till, every Jimmy Crute, and every one of these guys who's pushed to a card of relevance and then loses, you have uh, Paulo Enrique Costa, uh, <laughs> who just rises to the occasion and beats you all Romero. Uh, yeah, you have so many of these guys. But we saw that fight, man. Did he really beat you all Romero? Hey, who got the W? That's what matters. Yeah, Ultimately, that what matters. that's what matters in the UFC. But one guy who I'm really happy uh, for is Uriah Hall. Uh, Uriah Hall. Oh, yeah. If you finally picked up a win, man. This is his first back-to-back win since, like, what, 2015, 16? Something to that effect. And that was this was a really close fight, though. Oh, definitely. Split decision. Um, could have gone either way. This was the perfect striker versus grappler dynamic. I love this fight. Uriah Hall was ranked number 12 before this fight. It's now on a 2-5 win streak, like you said. So and he wants the Derek Brunson fight. Which, again, makes sense. <laughs> makes a lot of sense, I think. Primarily because we can see the same uh, striker versus grappler mm-hmm. fight play out again. And if it's ev- any evidence, Uriah Hall's come leaps and bounds in terms of his composure. He's not throwing those crazy strikes like he always used to. And I think it's just a fight that makes sense. Antonio Carlos Jr. looked well, uh, looked good in this fight as well. It was a very close fight. But ultimately, I all, I think Uriah Hall did do enough yeah. to pick up the win. And I'm really happy for him. Yeah, but so where does Hall go from here? Uh, is it Derek Brunson? Yeah, it makes, yeah, Derek Brunson makes perfect sense. I'm sure Derek Brunson has bigger plans, but... I think he needs to take this fight as well because Uriah Hall ultimately, um, if if you're just being honest about it, is ranked number 12. Just beat a really mm-hmm. impressive Antonio Carlos Jr. Well, ultimately, if you look at the rest of the heap of this division, of the middleweight division, um, it makes sense for him to fight maybe somebody like Uriah Hall as opposed to jumping up too soon. <clears throat> but this was this card. UFC Vancouver. Holy yeah. shit. I love this card so much. And oh, I'm dude. so glad I was. This is one of my favorite cards of the year so far. Even though the Todd Duffy fight uh, ended in pure disappointment with an eye poke. Even though um, the Glover fight wasn't too crazy. Well, ultimately, everything else. All the other four fights on this card. Absolutely loved them. Was on the edge of my seat for most of them. But the future, my friend. The future looks bright. And it's not just because of Elon Musk, because we have two cards coming up that are going to blow your mind. So UFC 243, Whitaker Adesanya in the Marvel Stadium in Australia. Wow. Also playing host to Holly Holm versus Raquel <clears throat> Pennington. Raquel Pennington, who was 1-2 and two in her last three, lost to, but but lost to very impressive fighters in Jermaine Durandamay and Amanda Nunes. Yeah, um, that, Holly Holm just coming off her loss to Chris Iborg. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I thought, I thought you were talking about Nunes. I was like, do you remember what <laughs> happened to Cyborg against Nunes? But yeah, and Whittaker Asani in itself is just a pure f- striker's heaven kind of a fight. So wow. I can't wait for that. But the other card, oh my God, Madison Square, S- Madison Square Garden. November 8th, you have Jorge Mazudal versus Nate, Nate Diaz. Diaz. Literally for a belt. <laughs> I don't know if I read this properly, but Dana White's actually going to put a baddest motherfucker on the planet belt around one of these guys' waist, which is genius. Thank you, finally, for listening to something. Defa- he didn't... Okay, okay. If this happens, by the way, I don't understand Dana White anymore. I used to think I understand this guy, but he would make a baddest motherfucker on the planet belt, but not a 165-pound <laughs> division. <laughs> <laughs> and look at the guys who would be going for this belt. Donald Cerrone, Mike Perry... Um, you could put all of them in a Robbie Lawler, <laughs> Robbie Lawler, freaking any of these, these guys can make a 165 pound division in itself. But I really hope he just announces like, oh yeah, this is a 170, this is the 165, but he's not gonna, he's not gonna cave basically. 
But you have Masvidal Diaz and you have Derek Lewis versus Blagoy Ivanov. And wow. I'm a big fan of Blagoy Ivanov, primarily because he it's looks like, like Rocky IV. <laughs> <laughs> Except Derek Lewis is black <laughs> and they're fighting in America. <laughs> Everything else, and Blagoy is not like a built machine <laughs> like he is, like uh, Ivan Drago was. Uh, but I love Blagoy primarily because he looks like the most generic Russian <laughs> mobster that you can ever think of. No, I'm kidding. He's a great fighter. Um, and Derek Lewis, of course, this is his big fight after his balls were hot. No, <laughs> his balls were hot. And then he fought DC. <laughs> then his balls were cold. Now I just hope his balls are hot again. And then you have Corey Anderson versus Johnny Walker. Wow. Wait, but so Johnny Walker <laughs> just died in his last fight at the hands of Misha Serkinov, right? Johnny Walker? That no. was Johnny Walker. No, that was Jimmy Crute. No, 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 no. So that was uh, Misha Zerkinov's fight this time. But before that, his no. last fight was against Johnny Walker. No, no, no. Who oh, Johnny Walker? Misha Serkinov died at the hands of Johnny Walker. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you said Johnny Walker died at the hands of Misha Serkinov. <laughs> this is why we need headphones, man. Oh, dude. Just too broke. Anyway. Um, but yeah, Khalil Roundtree uh, Jr., uh, who this guy, um, sorry, Johnny Walker beat uh, fight night 140 uh, with an elbow in the first round, minute 57. Then Justin Ledette. Fight night 144, TKO spinning back fist in punches in 15 seconds. That's right, 15, one five seconds. And then Misha Serkinov at UFC 235, same card as John Jones and, and Anthony Smith. What, like 36 seconds? 38. Wow. 38. wow. Memory. Uh, uh, flying knee and punches. So uh, this is an amazing fight. Uh, and Corey Anderson, of course, has a lot to prove. He's been calling John Jones out, so on and so forth. Uh, and he's, of course, coming off three wins as well. Pat Cummins, who has, again, been somebody who's been at the, uh, you know, top 15 at least of the division. Glover Teixeira, who we saw just pick up a split division, split decision win. Uh, and Elir Latifi, who was, of course, always, I said Latifi, like the Pakistani Latifi. Um, but yeah, Elir Latifi, let's just, let's, <laughs> not Latifi, but Latifi, uh, who just, uh, he beat him. In, and But again, again, these three were unanimous decisions. So I think this is one of those fights which goes a distance, goes to Corey. Gets finished, and we know who's winning, and that's yeah. Johnny Walker. But I think I'm most excited for Adesanya versus Whitaker. Oh, yeah. Dude, that fight's going to be great. Like, I I really... Okay, so I don't want to talk about the fight yet, because I really want to yeah. give this fight the due respect of sitting and watching all of... Uh, well, we've watched their fights, but really focusing in on what the hell these guys do, because Adesanya is so good. Um, Whitaker is just so much better in my opinion I think he's gonna win uh, but let's see speaking of Adesanya um, Gaslam versus Still is on the Madison Square Garden wow. card as well wow. and the last fight I'll tell you um, not for the filthy casuals of the world but Vincente Luque versus Stephen Wonderboy Thompson oh Dude, Luke is on a six-fight win streak, back-to-back -back wins over Brian Barbarina, which was one of the best fights I've seen this year, and Mike Perry, which is, again, another one of the most impressive fights I've seen this year. He deserves fighting Stephen Thompson, not just in terms yeah, of the rankings. the gatekeeper, straight up. Just give him the gatekeeper of the division. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's Stephen Thompson's, of course, at number nine, with Cynthia Lucas 14. This can leapfrog him straight into the top 10 yeah. when Sinta Luke has been so impressive he calls himself the silent assassin I can't wait for this fight I can't wait for this card but there's just so much happening in the world of MMA right now uh, I just love it I was hoping you'd say something because <laughs> last time I got a lot of stick uh, from people for saying I talk too much and la 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 we should probably clarify um, <clears throat> our good friend was sick uh, yeah, that was pretty sick that's our excuse. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's actually sick. And he wanted me to talk more and more and more. Yeah, so my idea was that I would just like kind of pose questions yeah. so that you could keep the conversation flowing. Yeah. But I wasn't really in a position to talk too much then. Yeah. Like I just needed hot coffee and just constantly rely on it for support at that point. I think you've done much better today. Not that it's a performance review or anything. But, <laughs> but I, 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 yeah, I mean, see, this is Badr Ali, ladies and gentlemen. This, this is... The not stiff, totally relaxed, chilled out, casual, like not casual <laughs> fan, but casual. Shade. <laughs> Shade. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, this is the best time. <laughs> okay, so the last video started oh, with me cool. saying, this is the best time to be an MMA fan, this and that. And I had to edit the video myself this time. Uh, our good friend Umar Fassi, shout out Umar Fassi, is doing Great it for guy, us. Great guy, man. I haven't even <laughs> met him yet. <laughs> what a just lovable guy. the fact guy. that he would take that weight off of all of us in this room. <laughs> They're just two people. <laughs> I need to confess. Um, video editing is not easy. I 
freaking hate myself because I wasn't able to put two cameras in the same frame and then match and sync the audio and then do the camera switching and all of that. And Umar Fassi is an angel in disguise because he's descended down from the heavens. Uh, descended? Ascend- descended. Yeah, heavens, heavens above us, right? So we're, we're going to get blasphemous there, right? <laughs> I'm just asking God, okay? <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's going to do this from now on. But I was... I heard my voice so much the last time we made a video and all I heard over and over again was oh, this no. is the best time to be in the mix I hate myself but yeah anything else you want to talk about related to the world of mixed martial arts or otherwise my friend I think we've covered it and see we need a better cue to end these podcasts last time was pretty awkward this time I literally ask you if there's anything else you want to talk about <laughs> <laughs> and it's, this means the episode which is which is the question that leads to anything but the end <laughs> it's like please <laughs> scattered over i think we're both pretty tired man it's what is it a tuesday no it's monday it's a monday it's a monday ladies and gentlemen we hope you had a great monday by the time this is uploaded it's probably going to be wednesday um but we hope you had a great monday we hope you have a great rest of the week we hope you're ha- we hope you have We hope you <laughs> we hope you're having a great today. We hope you have a great tomorrow and we hope you have a great forever after. <laughs> Is this the Delhi Tubby's outro, man? <laughs> What's wrong? I'm with? sorry. I'm really trying. I'm clutching on straws here. Like see, we're in our comfort zone when we're talking about fights and stuff to that effect but as soon as it comes up, when it comes to our personalities or like addressing someone <laughs> <laughs> or just our personalities, who we are as people. Suddenly we're just <sighs> But yeah, it's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for tuning in. There's so much more coming your way. So much more, I promise you. And um, stick around, subscribe to the YouTube YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook page. Please do my groceries for me. Please <laughs> <laughs> get my tire changed in my car. No, I'm kidding. Just please subscribe on YouTube, like this video, share it for no reason whatsoever, even if you're not an MMA fan, even if you're not one of the five MMA fans who watch this. Um, it would be a pleasure. And for everybody who's shown so much support, sincerely. Like, so if there's even one person that sat through the entire first episode and now sat through the entirety of this episode, thank you. <laughs> that is why we're doing this. Yeah. No, well, we weren't supposed to say that because now it sounds like we're hungry for views. But really, we're doing this because we love it, right? Yeah, like obviously you love it. But at the same time, there is a reason this is a podcast. It's a reason why we're not sitting in some empty room just like, I want money. (laughs) Just like talking to each other because we do that all the time. The reason why we have these cameras up, the reason why we spent so much money on mics and equipment. We want money. (laughs) It's not true. (laughs) (laughs) There's a wider base of fans, man. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, if nothing else, uh, we hope we make a fan out of you. If you're not a fan already, oh, that's very unlikely. This is a beautiful sport. Please invest in it. Um, Not just for, you know, whatever content you can consume or fights that you can watch, but because this is one of the sports I truly and humbly believe um, can really help this country grow in so many ways. There's so much aggression on the streets. If you ever go out, um, if you drive, you know this. Um, There's aggression. There's impatience. There's no outlet for so many people to get these things out. One way or another, I think this is only a good thing uh, to happen to this country if the sport grows. Um, And we are just so grateful for you to tune in. Everybody who supported us after the first episode and who supported us during the first episode, uh, we know we're talking like we got thousands of views and millions of followers, but whatever whatever we got is way more than we expected. So <clears throat> thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, and now I think the outro makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. So we hope you're having a great today. We hope you have a great tomorrow. And I hope you have a f- great forever after. <laughs> that can't be our outro. This has been <laughs> this has been the way in. I've been Daniel Lassim This and is I'm Badr Ali. If you want to introduce me again for the fourth time in two episodes. <laughs> Sorry. Badr Ali, this is the way in. <laughs> what is this supposed to be now? Badr Ali, on the mic, the way in, episode two. Subscribe. <laughs> We're never doing that again. <laughs> okay, that's a wrap. We cut it at before subscribe. Or no, just just now would be a good part to cut it. I think it would be funnier. Oh, and... and.